Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this event, uh, which is being broadcast to you, well, from around the world, but at least partially located here in Jesus College in the University of Cambridge, which you can see behind me. Uh, my name is Julian Huppert. I'm the director of the Intellectual Forum uh, here at Jesus. Jesus College has an amazing history dating back to 1144, when a group of itinerant nuns were given a small plot of land. And we've developed uh, since then, created with not many people who've gone on to make a difference around the world. Uh, Thomas Cranmer, for example, who created the Church of England and the Book of Common Prayer. Malthus, who was very involved with population thinking around the world. Lisa Jardine, the brilliant Renaissance English scholar, or more contemporaneously, Clean Bandit, uh, whose track Rockabye has had well over a billion views. So the long history of surviving through pandemics of the past and present, and of trying to think on both a local and a global scale. And for that reason, it's a delight to be here to host the welcome of a hugely important report. Issues around vaccines have become clearly more and more important in this age of COVID-19. And we need to think both about the response now and what we can learn for the future. And so this report that we're about to launch is hugely important. I'm delighted to be here with one of our own senior research associates uh, at the Intellectual Forum, Adam Camrad Scott, who also runs the Global Health Security Network and we'll be hearing from him a bit later. But for now, it's an immense pleasure to hand over to a real international expert who I'm delighted will lead on the launch of this report. Uh, Michelle Williams, to many of you will need no introduction. She's Dean at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health and has published many, many hundreds of hugely impactful papers. Uh, she's worked elsewhere as an epidemiologist, interested in perinatal studies, um, and is a real expert. It's absolutely wonderful to have her with us tonight. Uh, Michelle, Dean Williams, thank you so much for being here and over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Julian, for that very generous and kind um, introduction. Uh, good evening, good afternoon, everyone. Um, as um, Julian said, I am Michelle Williams. I'm a reproductive and perinatal epidemiologist by training and have been for the last seven years the dean of the faculty at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. And it's a real honor and privilege to be a moderator of the next session, the conversation that we will be having with the authors of the report that Julian has mentioned. I'd like to start out by saying, um, asking um, Carrie um, and Julie to, um, 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 to turn on their uh, videos so that we can all see them and would ask um, you both to just briefly introduce yourself. And then after that, I will dive right into um, our conversation that I anticipate will last for about 20 minutes. And then we will open up the conversation so that our audience can be interactive and engage in the Q&A session as well. So Carrie, I'll start with you for a brief introduction, please. Thanks very much, Michelle. My name's uh, Carrie Wiley. I'm a senior research uh, fellow at the University of Sydney School of Public Health and a National Health and Medical Research Fellow. Um, I specialize in the social and behavioral aspects of vaccination and other health behavior, health behaviors. Um, I originally trained as a microbiologist. I then moved into epidemiology and then um, discovered social science. And my, my current stream of work is trying to better integrate social science and epidemiology data. Fantastic. And Julie? Thanks, Michelle. Uh, I have a nursing and midwifery background and um, 25 years ago went and did a Master of Public Health at the University of Sydney and really found my vocation there. Uh, so I've been working in public health since then and primarily in a similar career path to Kerry in the social and behavioural aspects of vaccination. And I have a particular interest in risk communication, particularly during health emergencies, which has been um, very useful to have during the pandemic. Uh, I now run a small program of research with Kerry 
at the University of Sydney, we call ourselves the Social and Behavioural Insights in Immunisation Research Group. I'm based in the School of Nursing and Midwifery and Kerry's based in the School of Public Health. That's fantastic. Thank you both. And I'm really looking forward to our engaging in a, in a series of question and answers. And I'd like to start with you, Kerry. Um, why don't we open up with just beginning to refresh all of our memories about the report? Can you share with us what's in the report and what you and Julie aim to achieve by um, putting so much of yourselves, your interdisciplinary work, your the work that you've done to really bring together all that um, is, is brought forward in this report around vaccine and vaccine hesitancy, particularly in this time of the COVID pandemic? Thanks, Michelle. So the report is looking at specifically the social and behavioural drivers of COVID vaccine uptake and also some of the things that can be done to help increase vaccine uptake. And there are a few things we wanted to really achieve with this report. The first thing that was important to do for us was to broaden the conversation beyond hesitancy. When we talk about vaccine uptake, particularly around COVID vaccine uptake, the conversation generally goes straight to vaccine hesitancy. Mm -hmm. um, and hesitancy is absolutely an important thing to, to understand and, and to try and address and think about. But there are a whole lot of other things that go into whether or not someone has a vaccine um, that, that is beyond hesitancy. And so the first thing we wanted to do was to, to, to open that conversation up, open, open up that, that thinking to include hesitancy, but to also move beyond it. Um, the way we did that was using the, 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 the WHO's um, social and behavioural drivers or the behavioural and social drivers framework, the BEST framework that the WHO, uh, Julie and I were, were actually involved in developing. Um, and the reason we went with that particular framework is because it's got a very pragmatic focus. And that was the other thing we wanted to do here was to make this very um, tangible, pragmatic um, in its focus. And this um, the WHO based framework is um, good for that because it focuses on things that are measurable in the individual when it comes to um, what impacts vaccine uptake. It focuses on things that are quite proximal to the vaccination decision, so it doesn't sort of take into account sort of um, things like historical context or political persuasion, things that can be measured but not necessarily changed, which is the third reason this is a good framework to use, um, because the things that are focused on using that framework are potentially changeable with interventions or programs. So we use that framework to then go through the broader um, group of things that, that can uh, impact someone's decision to vaccinate. So what people think and feel, what's internal, so uh, thoughts about whether or not the vaccine is necessary, um, disease risk, uh, vaccine safety, all of those sorts of things. But it also focuses on things like um, the, the, the um, social aspects of it. So we don't make vaccine decisions in a vacuum what people think and do and feel around us is also important and will also influence that. So this framework also looks at that. It looks at motivation, which is where hesitancy sits in this framework. Yeah. And it also really importantly looks at the practical things that people um, need to get that vaccination. Um, and uh, it's obviously really important because if you keep focusing on hesitancy, for example, you can have someone who's highly hesitant but still be vaccinated. But conversely, conversely, you can have someone who's not hesitant at all who remains unvaccinated for other reasons. So this is why we wanted to broaden the, yeah. this conversation and use this framework. And the last thing we wanted to do with this, this report in keeping with the, um, the pragmatic sort of focus was to move beyond understanding the things that can affect the, the vaccine uh, decision making and how to measure it, we wanted to move into what to do about it. Yeah. And so in the report, we also cover some of the evidence base about different interventions that can be used um, in different settings and we give some examples. Yeah, yeah. 
You know, I, I really appreciate your getting into the framework. And one of the one of the key points that comes through in the report is one of the reasons you liked and selected this framework was also that it avoids getting trapped in just looking at the deficit model of things, right? So the report um, looks, takes a 360 view and teaches us about what are the factors that motivate acceptance. Mm -hmm. And as all of us know in, in public health and in epidemiology in particular, we're driven by a deficit model, right? We look at the risk factors as opposed to the enabling factors. And so I, I love that very early on, you thought so comprehensively, you know, about looking at the enabling as well as the, the you know, the, the factors that drive underutilization of, mm -hmm. um, of vaccines. So, um, Julie, I'd like to turn to you next. And, you know, um, we are still working our way through a once in a century pandemic. And um, clearly um, public health authorities have made vaccination um, a global priority against COVID. Um, but sometimes government and commun communities might have disalignments in what's a priority. And for those of us in the global health space, have heard as we've interacted with other colleagues in global health that many of their stakeholders and constituents challenged whether or not COVID vaccination should be a priority. Some argued that, you know, unfinished business in providing clean water and toilets should be the priority. And yet others talked about infant nutrition and supply chain of formula, you know, um, in some developed countries, including my own in the US. So can you tell us how do we reconcile these differences in alignments of priorities and with a particular accent on, especially when the priority is one that emerges during a pandemic where there is so much global inequity in global health? Mm, yeah, this is a, a huge question. and. I think those of us who work in vaccination often come from a broader clinical or public health perspective and, and share that sense of priority for other public health prevent, prevention issues. Um, you know, for, for you, Michelle, perinatal health, you're, you're thinking about um, the health of pregnant women and safe births. And, uh, and certainly for me as a midwife, I'm, I'm thinking about those things as well. Uh, vaccination is something that can be readily measured. So thinking about this from a very critical perspective, that which we can easily measure is often the thing that we focus on and the social determinants of health that affect all of the outcomes in public health uh, are, are less easy to measure. Um, and, and I'm mindful of this because Julian told us just before the forum that uh, he's the nephew of Sir Michael Marmot, um, who was uh, such a, who was the leading thinker in this area with his Whitehall study. So yes, other the countries will have different priorities. I think what's essential with vaccination is that the um, the the benefits of vaccines, which vary depending on the vaccine um, and its effectiveness. Uh, are recognised and that governments remain committed and prioritising vaccination, particularly childhood vaccination, uh, given that uh, childhood vaccines prevent millions of deaths each year, save uh, huge amounts of, of money for countries. So it is a worthwhile priority, but if you ignore some of the other basics, then you can uh, First of all, you can potentially undermine your vaccination program and you're not giving people what they need. Uh, so, for example, you look at the case of uh, Kano province in northern Nigeria, where um, we saw the beginning of a boycott against the polio vaccine in 2003. And that, um, that was caused by <clears throat> a whole lot of factors surrounding it, politics within the country, but one of the big things was that people weren't even getting very basic primary care 
even clean drinking water in some parts of northern Nigeria, yet they had people coming to their home constantly with the polio vaccine. And so that was part of the seed of mistrust along with a, a champion for the idea in the context of September 11th that, the, that this, this should be against the West. So um, I guess it was used as a political lever, this boycott, mm -hmm. and it caused polio to reemerge in that country. Um, and and since, which since has recovered through a lot of high level diplomacy. But you know, you, you, somebody who works in in indigenous health with me in Australia said, if you get the process right, the outcomes take care of themselves. So whether it be nations um, or small communities, listening to the needs of the community is important. And I think you often find that you end up with shared goals around vaccination anyway, because child health um, is so important. The COVID vaccine is a, a different animal, and I'm not going to go into great detail on that, but it certainly remains important. Three doses in particular remain important, yet we know that many countries uh, couldn't even get that in a timely way while there was still a lot of motivation from political leaders and citizens. Yes, you, you, you know, you, in your response, bring up so many areas that we could go deep in. One that you raise um, is listening, listening to what the community wants and needs. But you also brought up a very important point, and we've been hearing this in, in almost every sector of society now, and this is the concept of trust. And I want to delve into that a little bit more, um, because in public health, we're constantly um, working to engage collective action to support uh, public health um, outcome interventions for um, positive outcomes. And so I'd love to go a little bit deeper in this concept of the importance of trust in the vaccination uptake in particular, but we can broaden it as well. And so to you, Carrie, tell us a bit more about what, what happens, add a little bit more to Julie's contribution about what happens when trust falters in the context of response to a public health pandemic or an outbreak, let's say, for example, similar to what happened um, in Nigeria in this community around measles. Yeah, look, for me, tr trust is such a, uh, a broad concept and it, it's important at sort of, if, if you think about um, different levels, like also almost a social ecology, it's important at all of those levels. Um, we need trust in, in a government, in, in the healthcare system, at a population level. We need um, trust in the, the vaccine itself, but we also need trust in the clinic at an individual level between the person receiving the vaccine and the healthcare provider. And so if, if something uh, challenges the trust at any or all of those levels, it can be really difficult to, to deal with um, because of what drives that trust, it's experience, it's quite often experience, we've got uh, evidence around experience of uh, those around us, that um, it's, a, um, it's the availability. It, it doesn't matter how much data we can put in front of somebody, if somebody's family member has had that experience, that is always going to be uh, a, a greater influence on their, on their trust. That said, there is also a lot of evidence and a lot of good work that's been done about what we can do. Yeah. So we can work to maintain the trust. Um, and when it does falter, there are things that can be done. So if, for example, there is a vaccine scare, a safety scare, um, communication is so important. And there are so many things that can be done, even just with communication. So communicating early and transparently and with empathy yeah. um, can go a long way right up front um, to, to, to get ahead of it. It's um, having a two-way conversation, so not thinking of communication is just providing information, but getting back to what we were talking to be about before, listening to communities and what their concerns are and what their needs are. Um, another really important thing is to use that listening, to, to listen to what the, the, the communities need and want to help identify a trusted spokesperson 
um, it's not always necessarily going to be somebody from the government. Um, there, there were examples we saw during the pandemic where there were TV celebrities that were the trusted voices. So it's it's identifying not just what the messages are and how to present them, but also who to, who to present them. But even more individually, for example, at a clinic level, um, there, we've got a lot of evidence that um, if something goes wrong or somebody has a bad experience or somebody believes the vaccine, um, they've had a bad reaction to the vaccine, how that's handled at an individual level in the clinic can have huge impact on a whether or not that individual continues to vaccinate but also the people around that individual so for example if somebody is dismissed and saying that couldn't possibly have happened with the vaccine generally is um not very helpful in rebuilding and maintaining trust whereas if it's handled sensitively and with compassion and Julie's done a lot of work um, over the past few years in developing uh, interventions and tools for, for providers in dealing with these situations. Um, that level of trust is also important to maintain. And, and there, as I said, there are things that can be done to, um, I guess, minimize the damage. Is this that <laughs> that I'm trying to find? But, yeah. Yeah. yeah, Julie, I don't know if you want to jump in there. Yeah, I would love, Julie, your perspective, and I would particularly maybe even put you on the spot and ask you a little bit about um, where might you have seen examples in the recent past of um, some of these very clear and pragmatic ways to communicate and build trust um, that Carrie describes exercise, because I've been searching for examples. I'll just say to you, every time a public health leader in my country got on national television and looked in the camera and said, follow the science. I thought it was such a missed opportunity to engage compassionately with people who were vaccine curious. So mm -hmm. I can put forward examples where it didn't work to build trust. And I'm hoping, Julie, you can give us some examples where you've seen it work. Yeah, I'll look, um... I think the one that comes to mind that, you know, I've learned about uh, is the, so last September, we joined an Australian delegation to Israel to learn more about the way they managed the vaccine rollout because they had early access to Pfizer. They had good data because of their systems uh, and their healthcare structure, and they had data that we used in Australia to inform our vaccine program rollout, particularly about timing of doses, et cetera. So what, one of the things we did was we heard from at the Ministry of Health, an Orthodox Jewish, ultra-Orthodox Jewish consultant who had been employed by the ministry to work with ultra-Orthodox Jewish communities and rabbis at, throughout the pandemic, but particularly mm -hmm. at the start of the vaccine rollout. So the vaccine rollout went very well there. And uh, we know that there are some communities uh, in, for example, uh, New York State, Brooklyn area, where they've had struggles with measles because yeah. there has been less trust in vaccination. Uh, and uh, these communities have been targeted by uh, quite sophisticated anti-vaccination activism. And so there have been challenges, but what happened was that the ministry uh, recognised that at the start of lockdowns, it was very, very difficult for ultra-Orthodox people to be separated from each other because meeting together is part of an important daily practice. Uh, it's uh, important religious practice. Uh, and, and there was kind of, there was a little bit of stigmatisation of communities around that because the public were fearing that these communities might break lockdown rules and, and cause the greater spread of COVID in the country before it was really established. Uh, so the ministry had a, a sort of, they came to a point where they had to decide, are we going to very actively keep working to engage or are we going to use more of a, an enforcement orientation here? And they chose to keep engaging and they worked quite hard to do that. They engaged with rabbis, with communities in many different ways. 
And what that meant was that when the vaccine rollout began, in the end, for the, there was a young woman who was pregnant and she died from COVID. And that had a big impact on the community as well. Her husband said, I wish she'd been vaccinated. Um, so that story, that narrative was influential. But it was also that foundation of trust that the government had built up with the communities that meant that they were more willing to accept the vaccine and, in fact, uh, higher vaccination rates in the initial phases in the ultra-Orthodox Jewish um, communities. So it's a really nice case study in how hard work to listen, to truly engage, to be respectful, can reap great rewards in for the public health or for the health of those those communities and others. Yeah, that's a great example. And so many of the touch points of the basic pragmatic elements of what it requires to build trust and communicate effectively so that um, the institutions, the organizations and the public health servants um, have that trustworthiness because we have to be trustworthy and yeah. then the trust will follow. And, and so this example is just a beautiful example also of how we need to be mindful as we listen, we have to design for specific community characteristics and profile and history. Yeah, and I think that's why community engagement, you know, when you look at the evidence, which is uh, one of the things that um, uh, we done as part of the WHO behavioural and social drivers of vaccination work was to look at the evidence on what improves vaccine uptake and some of that is featured in this report so have a read um one of the one of the things that does work and probably is one of the few things that actually addresses hesitancy is community engagement yeah. and i think i think partly because it it pings so many motivators it first of all it works with informing communities um, but it also listens to communities so health services can tailor their approaches to improving access to vaccination to the specific needs of those communities and that because we know that action is the loudest form of communication that action builds trust as well and in it because it's a two-way process that builds the trust as well as, as sort of helping people overcome those practical barriers but um, the, 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 the great thing about these examples is that they can inspire others because we know that, you know, we say trust arrives on foot and leaves yeah. on horseback. <laughs> and so then if you've lost trust, you know, of particular communities and you want to regain it and you're really committed to doing that, how do you do that? And I think some of the tips in the later part of the report around risk communication, particularly in dealing vaccine hesitancy or refusal, are going to be uh, uh, quite helpful in touching on, you know, just giving you a bit of a snapshot of some of those things that are, are involved in good community engagement and risk communication. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, for the audience, if you have not read the report, I encourage you to do so. And if you look in the chat part of this uh, web chat, um, you will see the link to the report. I highly recommend that you download it, have a PDF copy of your own, uh, so that you can delve into many of the um, practical, thoughtful, um, really comprehensive um, review of the challenges, but the opportunities. Um, to in increase uh, vaccine acceptance um, uh, through um, pragmatic, thoughtful um, interventions that have been discussed by Carrie and Julie. I have one last question before we open it up for the audience. And the, true to form, the report focuses on vaccine uptake and vaccine hesitancy. And we know that there are many other vaccine programs that are facing challenges. And so I wanted to open the aperture a bit and ask each of you in a lightning round, if I, if you will, if I will, um, what other vaccine programs are there where we have a real need for applying the lessons learned and some of the pragmatic principles in increasing uptake 
Um, and we've talked about measles a bit, but I, I know that there are several others, and I know you have lots of experiences with other vaccine preventable diseases. And I thought we would end this session with talking, broadening the aperture a bit. And I'll start with you, uh, Carrie, and then over to Julie. Um, oh, look, the, the evidence that we've drawn on in the report, um, we've, we've looked specifically at COVID vaccine. Um, and the things that drive COVID vaccine are often vaccine specific and context specific, but underneath all that, there are some, some commonalities and some similarities. And I, I think certainly measles comes to mind for me, but the childhood um, programs um, in general, given yeah. the, uh, you know, in many, many um, resource um, constrained settings there, through necessity, there were uh, uh, resources moved out of some programs to support COVID um, vaccine programs. There are now programs, particularly in, uh, the, the, to me, the childhood um, vaccination programs that really now need to be looked at yeah. sort of in a, I won't say post COVID, but yeah. sort of um, moving forward from this point to try and bring those back up to where they were or even further up. Yeah, you know, that's such an important point because um, the complexity of the childhood vaccines, you know, they're multiplex. Um, and they've gone from single to multiplex, and we've not kept up with informing and educating the public, uh, the what's and the how's um, around that. And I remember in teaching in my maternal and child health course, we would every year have to go a deeper dive into uh, developmental immunology to explain, you know, why the protocol um, and the vaccination programs were changing uh, to combine MMRs, you know. So that's a great example. And it's one where we have to really keep up with elevating health literacy, particularly for young mothers who are you know, faced with making a decision about complying to the protocol. So that's a great point. And, and really the work's not done. We have a lot more work to do specifically in that space. Julie, over to you. So I'm just thinking about some recent work we've done with um, UNICEF, with the Indonesian Ministry of Health, uh, where we uh, worked with local partners at Universitas Indonesia, um, led by Dr. Miko. Uh, and we were looking at the impact of the pandemic on routine immunisation of children and the particular barriers that, that caregivers and parents experienced. Um, and we were focused on two particular provinces because, as many of you will know, Indonesia is a highly diverse country. It's a big country. And, and the provinces and even districts can be quite... Uh, quite heterogeneous, heter heterogeneous. So uh, these two provinces, had the, what they were not where we've ended up seeing um, vaccine-derived polio come up recently, which often comes through low polio vaccination rates. However, we did learn some interesting things. Um, and this is where using the behavioural and social drivers of vaccination tools can be helpful because it can give you a sense of where the biggest barriers to vaccination are and then you can pivot to interventions, right? So there's, there's no point assuming, second guessing that everyone is, is just resisting vaccination and therefore you need to convince them. If actually one of the big issues is that people are turning up for vaccines and being turned away because yeah. of supply and distribution problems. So understanding where the major sort of barriers are, starting with the perspective of caregivers, um, of children, of parents, and for, for COVID vaccines, for vaccine recipients themselves is very, very important. It's not the only bit of data, but it's an important part of it. So we did that. And what we learned in these two, uh, these two areas of two particular provinces, Central Java and West Nusa Tangara, is that the communities, uh, so the, the respondents were generally very supportive of vaccination and only 4% were against it. But there were a good proportion of people who were finding it hard to access services or being turned away or um, not, not, not 
being confident that the vaccine would be at the clinic. Now, this is a year ago, so they're also still coming out of the COVID lockdowns as well. Um, and there was also the issue of someone in the family being sick when a vaccine is due. Now, we know that one of the big barriers to timely vaccination <clears throat> is false contraindications, right? The provider thinks that an unwell, slightly unwell child with a bit of a fever shouldn't be vaccinated, they should delay it. And in fact, they can, it's only when the fever reaches a certain level that, that they should wait. So if you know those things, you can act on them. So we've been working with the ministry and we're still in that phase of, of, of coming together with the recommendations, which are around looking, re-looking at supply and distribution issues, re-looking at province and district ownership of vaccination programs and priorities, which is the thing that we were talking That's about at the beginning. Um, but also uh, making sure that parents are confident that the vaccine will be there when they turn up, that the services are easy to reach. In some countries, even home visiting can be very helpful and some countries use that a village to village, house to house model as a as a routine immunisation provision. Um, so it's and and also in terms of the the way people think and feel and the the way they're socially influenced, we did see that there were huge strengths in the way community leaders and religious leaders had because they were interviewed as part of the process as well had really engaged with the need to encourage people to have the COVID vaccine in their communities. That's a strength. Yeah. And strengths-based approaches are important to think about here because if you know where the strengths of the community are, you can work with those. So if you're worried about um, the, the, the hesitancy around vaccination in Arche, for example, then working with the lo local religious and community leaders is very important. I'm not going to say it's going to be simple. Um, it certainly has been done already in Indonesia, keeping on doing that is so important. Yeah. Thank you so much. I'm going to I'm going to end where I started and my contribution where I started by thanking you both for this incredible report. Um, for those of you in the audience, you have you've just basically gotten a taste of the very thoughtful scholarship that has been brought forward um, um, in this report by both Julie and Carrie. I also want to take a moment and thank um, Adam um, as leading the Global Health Security Network in commissioning such a report. To connect back to Julian's introduction, this pandemic has been an opportunity for us to really take home on board the lessons learned and to not just think about how we can take those lessons and instrumentalize them for improving COVID vaccination, but to think broadly about the work that we do in public health across other vaccination programs, but even how we message other non-vaccination public health interventions. For those of you who have the link, again, I encourage you to read it. It is uh, well-researched, beautifully written, and quite comprehensive for all of us who are students and practitioners in, in public health. Um, I'd like to now turn back the podium, virtual podium over to Julian. And Julian, I can see that there are a number of questions from the audience. And so I will turn it over to you. Thank, thank you very much. And it's uh, been fascinating to hear such a wonderful discussion uh, and the aspects about trust and trustworthiness and so much more. Um, I actually think Adam was was going to, to take on the question, but can I just start off with one of the ones that that's uh, come up um, from Samuel Alabi, uh, who asks, did you observe a relationship between education and vaccine uptake? Is basic science literacy a factor? Yeah, yes and no. I Great question, Samuel. Um, it's funny, you, you would expect education and vaccine uptake to always be correlated. So the, the, some people will think the greater the education level, the greater the uptake. Not the case at all. 
Um, it can depend. It's very situation specific. And it, I think it's usually related to things that ride along with different levels of education. So health literacy is associated with vaccine uptake, but health literacy and vaccination are not the same things. In some studies, uh, you find that people who are highly educated and people who have very low levels of education are less likely to be vaccinated. And they're often for quite different reasons. Up the high level, you're often looking at hesitancy. The lower level, you're looking at um, issues around access and having the resources and capabilities to get to services and vaccines. So it does vary. Uh, I think generally uh, this, some of the studies around COVID vaccination, you've seen a gradient where the, the the less education you have, the less likely you have been to be vaccinated. But that I think is a perennial issue in any vaccine rollout where the people who are experience inequitable access to health care and all the resources that we need to get that uh, have a, a, a um, vaccinated in a less timely way in a new vaccine rollout. So you see bigger gradients, bigger disparities at, at the beginning of a rollout. And then as time goes on, those disparities can narrow. Can I add um, uh, uh, just a little addendum to Julie's response because it's very country specific. In the United States, we see an intersectionality of low, um, low educational attainment and political party affiliation. Um, and this is um, sadly um, um, in part a result of the politicization of the COVID pandemic and the response, um, the vaccine availability. And so in the United States, we see um, non-college educated whites in geopolitical regions that are also predominantly Republican uh, having lower vaccine uh, acceptance and uptake and regrettably higher preventable loss of life because of that. Mm -hmm. And this is something that we will have to reckon with um, as we go forward is addressing the vaccine literacy and also this issue of a tendency to the politicization and the vulnerability of some people to misinformation. It's an unfortunate um, shift that's happening, you know, just quickly, Adam, sorry to interrupt. Globally, uh, usually there's not, there hasn't in the past been a lot of um, ideological gradients around vaccine acceptance. So people across the ideological spectrum have accepted vaccines for children. But in the years before the pandemic, we were starting to see people on the far right more hesitant, more refusing in some countries. Um, most people everywhere vaccinate. We're talking about differences between groups that are small groups. Yeah. But they're obviously, as you say, Michelle, a big issue in the US. And uh, we're, we're very concerned that those political um, uh, gradients might affect vaccine acceptance in other programs as well, notwithstanding the, the tragedy uh, for those people who are missing out on protection against COVID. If I just uh, could jump in uh, quickly to throw a couple of questions um, to our speakers. Um, there's one here from Matt, which is, how do we build trust in health messaging when health professionals engage with and deliver misinformation? And there's a slightly related question as well, which I'm just going to phrase as when governments also change criteria. So there's a, a bit of issues here about communications and how we manage that from that trust side of things. Yeah, I'm Kerry. Do you want me to? Do you want to jump in there, or? Oh, or do just you... the second part of that question about the changing of um, criteria. I, I, that was an issue uh, that came up really early in 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 the pandemic because we were in effect. I, I think I can't remember who said it, but um, somebody said we were in effect still trying to fly the plane where we were still trying to build it, right? So we that's science, we, as more information comes to light, more evidence comes to light, 
we adjust what we've learned and therefore what we do about it. And I think part of the issue is we need, um, as public health practitioners and as scientists, to, to better communicate that change is to be expected in something like that and, and somehow I think better communicate not just what the evidence is and what the changes are, but why there's been a change. I think this comes back to the transparent and honest and, and empathetic communication. Um, and with the sure. issue, of, yeah, with the issue of this is a really difficult issue when you have um, someone who is respected uh, give information, give, you know, misinformation or <clears throat> um, a particular angle on vaccine safety, for example. We saw that with the Andrew Wakefield and the MMR autism scare. We've seen it with, with um, many uh, respected health professionals around COVID vaccines uh, who are rightly worried, you know, about vaccine safety. We all want vaccines to be as safe as possible, but uh, they have um, really amplified a sense of uncertainty around particular adverse events that people experience and tied them to the vaccine. Um, or you get more sort of deliberate misinformation, disinformation from some as well. And of course, there are systems within, a, uh, you know, professional um, regulation uh, to uh, make sure that healthcare providers are, are not um, spreading misinformation about vaccines. Uh, but I think when that happens, it's one of the most, it's one of the ways that my PhD was on vaccine safety scares and kind of, I was kind of asking how does, why did the MMR autism scare catch fire? Because anti-vax activists are always seeking to undermine vaccine programs with all sorts of theories. Why did that one? It was the existence of a healthcare provider Andrew Wakefield, a doctor, respected, very articulate, um, very charismatic, and being a champion for these parents who were suffering. And they wanted to know the answer to their child's autism. Um, you have to come in quite quickly and, and work with, so you, you want to come in quickly with the accurate information, but timing is really important here. Um, you can't just overload people with sort of very complex, you know, information, lots of passive sentences that where your main point is buried halfway down the document. You've got to start with what you want people to remember right up front and then use trusted spokes, work with trusted spokespeople to make sure that people are in a sense inoculated mentally against some of that misinformation. There's a lot of research in psychology around that. So uh, rapid um, responses with good information using trusted spokespeople, but it's not easy. Thank you so much for that. Um, if we were to do uh, or take another question from you, um, this one is from Liz, and I'm just going to paraphrase it a little bit, um, that we've seen that there is um, often some hesitancy associated with the risk of vaccine harm. Um, and how do we sort of manage that when you have um, potentially a small uh, population or proportion of the population that have an ongoing risk level um, versus like a wider community then, which may have sort of moved past. And we've got uh, a question here as well from um, Santosh that talks about the fact that um, psychological fatigue is a, is a key issue here that we're also having to contend with in communities. Yeah. And, and, and fatigue of the program managers and the people in public health as well. Oh, uh, Kerry, did, did you want to say anything about this one? I'll, I'll start, um, let yeah, you okay. gather your thoughts. Um, when people, so when you're dealing with this, so there's several ways to deal with vaccine safety concerns. And one of the most important ways is through healthcare providers. But what if the person isn't actually going to that healthcare provider? And then I think it's it really is about responding in that. So it's the things I just said, responding in that timely way to vaccine safety concerns, providing great questions and answers. In Australia, the National Centre for Immunisation Research and Surveillance does this really well. You know, they they have a team with a technical understanding. They 
they get hold of common questions like the one around COVID vaccines and, and infertility, which is misinformation, and they address it with specificity. You know, they talk about the studies that, 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 that showed that that wasn't the case. You can't just say there's no evidence that. Um, but really for individuals in a clinical setting, it is about listening and um, looking at the root causes of their hesitancy and that the, the best way to do that, if you have a little bit of time, it shouldn't take too long, is to elicit their concerns to saturation. So they might seem hesitant and you think you know the reason because they've expressed it. But often the real reason is a bit buried and it might be a bad experience as, as we've seen a lot in our research with people who don't vaccinate. They're, they're a bit traumatised by something and they're expressing that through their vaccine refusal. Um or it might be just a need for reassurance and it might be quite simple. And healthcare professionals are so important, which is why it's so important to, to skill them up and support them in their, in their communication. And, and actually for that reason, we had developed a few years ago, the sharing knowledge about immunization package, which was to guide health professionals and having constructive conversations with people who are hesitant about vaccines. And we've used it a lot through the pandemic. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if I've answered the whole question very well, but I think I've I've answered bits of it. Kerry? Yeah, I, I totally agree with everything you said, of course. <laughs> but if I could add to that, and this stems from, um, some experience I had, um, we did a, a study over a couple of years where we sought out people who were actively refusing, like parents who were actively refusing vaccines for their kids. And one of the things, like, like it's one part of conversations with people who are, who, who are, are worried about risks and things, um, who are refusing vaccines is listening and, and reassurance and, and all of those things, but the other part um, is internal to the person who's having that conversation. Those conversations can be really hard um, and, and they quite often can disintegrate into an argument. Um, and so there is an element of mindfulness that's required when providing uh, like a, a sounding board or having a conversation, be it in a clinical setting or, or, or outside of that, where you need to really engage with the person where they're at and it's, it can be really difficult to put aside your own thoughts beliefs experiences and all of that particularly if that person is openly questioning your knowledge and your stance and and, and that kind of thing and, and so one of the things i found in engaging with these parents was to see them as parents i'm myself as a parent and so it was finding that common thread um, that enabled me to engage with them with empathy that really helped push aside sort of those feelings of, um, but wait, that's not right. So yeah, just adding to what Julie was saying, it's, it's, it's hard work to have those conversations for sure. And just a, a really quick plug, um, WHO produced a guidance around um, addressing vaccine safety scares that we we helped write. So I know it quite well um, and, and ended up sort of reading from that myself when we were dealing with some issues in Australia. <laughs> so reading from our own rule book, if you like, I'll try and find the link and put it in the chat um, for you. That's great. Thank you so much. Um, we are um, at time. So um, we we just really, the last thing to do now is to for me to thank folks. Um, I'd like to particularly thank um, Julian and the team at Jesus College and the Intellectual Forum for hosting this event. Um, we've really appreciated working with them and it, it's been great to be able to help contribute to um, these important public policy discussions um, with this particular issue as well. So big thanks and a huge um, shout out to Julian and the team there. Um, to Dean Williams, thank you so much for your leadership and your expertise and for also moderating this panel. It's been great to hear from you and to also hear from your uh, own experiences and expertise. 
Um, and of course, a, a massive thanks to Kerry and Julie, who are the authors of this report. Um, as you've heard, both are leading international experts in social and behavioural um, vaccine uptake. So we've really heard a fantastic um, overview of the key findings of the report, as well as some additional insights. Um, please do um, feel free to access the policy report and download it. We'll also talk with um, uh, the Intellectual Forum about those who have registered. If you'd like to be sent a copy of the report directly for those who have registered, we'll try and um, tr try and sort that out. But thank you so much to everyone um, and have a great day. Continue to stay safe. <laughs>